we have a sense of a business, if you like, a great business operating across the north of England and well down into, into the Midlands. This is quite a remarkable thing for the 15th century. If it were to be proved that these windows are the work of John Thornton, it would complete a picture that currently exists only on paper. Here was a medieval superstar artist with the savvy to market his talents across a great swathe of the country. Whoever did create these windows was clearly a master of his craft. And they become even more impressive when you discover what was involved in actually making them. Because in John Thornton's time, producing even a single sheet of glass was a skilled and labour-intensive process. At this works in Birmingham, they still use the same basic techniques as glassmakers in the 15th century. To produce a flat sheet of glass, you first have to make a cylinder. Walter Pinches has been a glassmaker for more than 40 years. What I'm doing now is a first time gather. This is to build, this is to build up the amount of glass as I want. Right, okay. So this is just clear glass at this the moment. This is just clear glass at the moment. Right, right. When Walter has gathered enough molten glass from the furnace, he adds the colour, which nowadays is ready-made. Medieval glassmakers would have added minerals to get the same result. Once the colour has been evenly absorbed, Walter can begin to shape the glass. There's something of magic or alchemy about this whole process. Just seeing the liquid glass come out of the furnace and then solidify, and then as the air is being introduced as well, it's, it's just such an incredible process. I can only imagine what it must have seemed like to the medieval viewer. Wow, it's just ballooning in there, isn't it? Then, as Walter begins to swing the balloon of molten glass, the shape of the cylinder forms. Over to the torch. Over to the table. This is a finished cylinder. Okay. All we have to do now is crack it off and put it in the oven. That's incredible. Finally, each cylinder is cut open and flattened to make a square edged pane. It's yes. incredible. <laughs> so much, it's so expensive. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, I can say. A tremendous amount of work was involved in making a material we nowadays take for granted. And even that was only the first step to crafting windows like these.
the skills that produced such finely detailed images have not been lost. A few miles outside the city of York is the studio of a contemporary stained glass artist, Helen Whitaker. Helen creates her own original window designs by the same process that John Thornton and his studio made the east window. So Helen, tell me what you're working on at the moment and um, where did you begin? This is a um, design for a church in um, Northamptonshire. This was a lovely brief in that it was set by the Flower Guild, the mm. church's Flower Guild. So I've got an arrangement of flowers associated with the seasons and then this kind of strong kind of cross, which is um, hopefully going to be quite striking, you know, against this kind of dark purple background. So this is the first stage. Mm. This is called the Vidimus. Mm. So it starts with um, initial pencil sketches and then you develop it up to colour. Mm, uh, wow. And then from that you, you scale them up to full size. Gosh, right. And this is what's called a cartoon. And I've also indicated the actual leads on there as well by these black lines. Right. So the cartoon really remains your point of reference for the painting and for preparing the glass. Yeah, very much so. It's key to the, to the whole, you know, to the whole design. It's by tracing with paint that the design on paper is transferred onto the individual pieces of glass. process are we at now then? So this is how I go about last painting. Right. I do the trace lines and then I'll do what's called the shading which is the matting afterwards mm. and um, this glass it's quite an unusual glass in that it's called a flashed glass. Mm -hmm. You can see it's red but it's actually um, two layers it's actually predominantly yellow with a flash of red on the top uh -huh. and what I've done here is actually taken away the red layer to reveal the yellow underneath. Right, right. Is this something that would have happened in the medieval period? It would have done, but this would have been done probably by a pumice stone, by yeah. some poor chap, you know, rubbing away for many hours. Mm. Today we're using acids which just, you know, eat away um, at the surface to reveal the yellow beneath. Mm. It's a lovely effect, isn't it, the two types of glass? Yeah. Um, so depending on how you apply the paint, you can get these different effects and textures. Yeah, I mean, it's all about modulating the light at the end of the day. And then once you've completed building up the paint. There's the firing of the glass. Mm. Um, the pigment has a glass powder mixed with it. What this does is when you come to firing the glass, the glass is slightly tacky at that stage. The pigment with the glass powder in it just adheres to the surface so they bond together, right. making it permanent. Finally, the pieces of painted glass have to be assembled and held in place with strips of lead. process and it was soldered and here we have it the, the finished piece ready hopefully to, to be fitted into the church it's absolutely beautiful I'm absolutely stunned by the finished product and seeing the way that it's got to this stage, this collaborative artistic process has just made me appreciate stained glass all the more
For the medieval church, having these technical and artistic skills to hand allowed for the creation of enormous narrative works of art to instruct and inspire worshippers. For us today, these are windows onto the medieval mind, revealing how people thought about the Christian faith at the time. And most revealing of all are the 81 panels of the east window depicting scenes from the book of Revelation, the biblical prophecy of the end of the world that became a popular obsession in the Middle Ages. Revelation was written by St. John of Patmos, a first century Christian who was persecuted for his faith and exiled from Rome. John foresees Christ's second coming at the end of time, when the earth will be destroyed. Good will triumph over evil. and the dead will rise for the last judgment. And when you hear them read today, John's descriptions of these apocalyptic events are still some of the most mesmerizing passages in all of the New Testament. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood which fell on the earth. And a third of the earth was burnt up and a third of the trees were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet. And a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountain of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the water because it was made bitter. Although Revelation is a book of prophecy, it gives no clues as to exactly when the end of the world will come. The great dread, of course, was that it might be imminent. So Christians needed to be ready to have their souls judged by God. The apocalypse became a hugely popular theme in medieval art, and not only in the great cathedrals. If you were sufficiently wealthy, you might own an illuminated manuscript. If you were not so well off, you wouldn't have to look far to find the same story on a church window or a wall. I'm standing in the parish church of All Saints North Street, just a stone's throw from York Minster. People grew up in these buildings. They were baptised, married and buried, with these stained glass images accompanying them through their lives. And what are we